Welcome, everybody. Uh, I think we'll get started now. Um, so welcome to the second event of the Mellon S Sawyer Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Ruth O'Brien. I'm a professor in political science, women's studies, and American studies. Uh, but before we begin today and, um, and, and gen start our general discussion, let me first render all the thank yous where the thank yous are certainly due. First, to the Graduate Center under President Bill Kelly's able leadership and to Provost Chase F. Robinson, who encouraged me to apply for this, and also, thirdly, to Vice President or Vice Provost Louise Lenahan, who has given us tremendous support and resources, as well as all of the Graduate Center to run this. And then fourthly, we have all the EOs have, who have been particularly helpful, and particular mention goes to Helena Rosenblatt, who today is hosting a reception in their department um, after this talk. And then fifthly, we have all the co-directors of the, um, the uh, Mellon Sawyer, and so I want to give special thanks to Carol Gould, who's been very active and indispensable in co-directing it from 2010 when we first started in collaborating and running this, because um, it's been a very long, you know, project. And she's uh, is running most of the events, so I have to give her extra special due. And as well as to Richard Mullen, who unfortunately I just found out is in China. <laughs> and uh, he started, though, in the early stages, and he did say he, he does have a conflict and can't be here for everyone. And then finally to Omar Dabor, who's in philosophy at Hunter and at the Graduate Center, who was very valuable um, despite coming in in our second round of um, obtaining the grant. And, in any, and we also have ABLE administrators. Uh, and so we have John Mahone, who's planned the web page and also doing the vodcasting. And I just got permission from Joan Scott and Ann Norton. We're hoping to put this up in iTunes University eventually because there's some really terrific programs up in iTunes University. And they last a long time. And we'll also like our last event posted on uh, YouTube. And we've had the great fortune of having, having um, Adam Edison, who is our postdoc. Um, he's coming from uh, Oxford, and he was a student of Jeremy Waldron's. And he's conducting the study group that many of you are in. Uh, and he's uh, hoping to advance, he's advancing his own career while he's here in Eurocentrism and human rights. Um, and then finally, we have two graduate students who have been tremendously helpful as well, Joss Keaton and uh, Flannery Omdal. And for this event, Flannery has been, you know, tremendous in getting everything together, and she's planned um, our reception for afterwards. Um, and then finally, I did ask my son to help pick up after the receptions. <laughs> <laughs> and he's actually interested in the topic, which is always something to say about a 15-year-old. Um, but I did want to clarify one of the things is that this, this whole seminar, the whole year, is about really difference and diversity. And from that perspective, I have invited these two people here today, and both of them have been inspirational to me over the years. And they've been inspirational because they published material really directly on the idea of difference and representation in the United States and the EU. And so this is really an outreach, an outreach uh, fellowship for the entire year that we're pri privileged to have. And the Graduate Center has really been immensely helpful in reaching out to other groups of people, and so this is what makes it more interesting, and so we are glad that most of you are reading the work and then able to participate in a different way. Um, but turning to today's logistics, what I was imagining is that we'll have Anne speak for about a half an hour, and then we'll have Joan speak for um, approximately the same amount of time, uh, but I'm going to give separate introductions for each one of them. Um, but let me start with Anne. It's Anne Norton is an acclaimed political theorist and political scientist, and I think I got to know her years ago when I first started my own career in attending politics and history sessions at the American Political Science Association. She's, uh, she was part of the Perestroika Rebellion in political science, which is to say bringing humanities into political science and arguing that social science shouldn't <coughs> be so scientific and that maybe we are more humanistic, and, uh, and also just a, a general rebellion against the quantitative element. But mostly her work is about the meaning and consequences of political identity. She explores this along in many different facets and planes, and she's written six books, and this is actually her seventh book. Just to go over them slowly, because they've all been controversial in their different ways, you have Leo Strauss and the Politics of the American Empire, Blood Rights of Late Modernity, World Flesh and Revolution, 95 Theses on pol Politics, Culture, and Method, and that's one that I had to struggle to get on our comprehensive reading examination because it's really a pivotal book. Republic of Signs, Liberal Theory in American Popular Culture, Reflections on Political Identity, Alternate Americas, A Reading of Antebellum Political Culture. All of her work that has been influential with this book I'm hoping will be uh, even more controversial in the sense of good controversy to spark 
and, and ignite all, all sorts of different discussions. I had the happy um, coincidence of having this grant coincide with this book as being published by the, by the Public Square with Princeton University Press, and it is entitled On the Muslim Question because, as you probably figured out, this is a play then on the Jewish question. But uh, her insights, I believe, it was a very short chapter that you read in Chapter 5 on terrorism, but her insights are very profound, and because the book is so well written, I think it's almost deceptive in its profundity. Without further ado, I'll turn over the mic to Ann Norton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And of course, thanks to Ruth for inviting me. Um, and many of you I've already noticed, to, I already owe debts, intellectual debts to many of you. So my greater thanks for that. Um, the book from which this is taken is... Um, only in this one respect, like Saeed's Orientalism. As Orientalism was not about the Orient, so this is about the West, not about Muslims primarily. Um, but it, it rather it argues that the questions that the West asks about Muslims and in relation to Muslims are not about, the, about Muslims, but about themselves, about the West, the West in which we live. And the questions are very simple and familiar ones democracy. And I have there particularly in mind Derrida's claim, Islam is the other of democracy, um, something which I think has been powerfully answered by Tahrir Square, but which reveals a set of Western anxieties about democracy, which are um, pointed and enduring. The, another question is freedom of speech. Uh, there, I want to contest the claim that the West really defends freedom of speech or protects freedom of speech as well as it claims. We have lots of censorship of our own, not least on the shop floor. But I'm also interested in the way in which Muslims and people who are sympathetic to Muslims are uh, required or a certain set of speeches is demanded of them. So Muslims are, are asked or or it's demanded that they denounce terrorism or um, that they recognize Israel or that they do a series of speech acts external to their own volition. And that, that imperative to speak a script written for you is what interests me. There's also the question of equality. Um, here I'm, I'm curious about Rawls's con construction of Kazanistan. Um, you know, Rawls invents this country. Now, Rawls isn't really got much given to the fabulous, um, but he invents this country called Kazanistan. And there is very little we know about Kazanistan, except that it's Muslim. And it's Muslim in order that it represents something radically alien to liberal democracy, a decent hierarchical society. But when one looks at what makes Kazanistan merely a decent hierarchical society, be becomes quite different to differentiate it from the liberal democracies of the West, which, after all, can really claim not more, not more than that, not more than being decent hierarchical societies. I'm also interested in the debates about women's sex and sexuality, the transformation of Ayan Hirsi Ali from a woman who admires the Netherlands for its decent landlords and well-functioning bureaucracy who's happy that she can vote, into a woman who's fleeing an arranged marriage and becomes an erotic object um, for an admiring set of Western intellectuals. I'm also interested about gay sexuality and, um, and the way in which gayness is made a kind of <coughs> litmus test for one's how shall we say it, one's political bona fides, that you must have a particular set of attitudes about gay sexuality in order to be part of the West or a decent human being. Um, I think this imposes particular burdens, as Judith Butler has pointed out, on people who are queer. Um, and it also raises the question, who would buy their freedom at the price of someone else's subjection? Certainly a price that I am not willing to pay. But it also raises a question of just how, how queer we are. Maybe we're not nearly queer enough. If the forms of sexuality and um, interpersonal engagement in the Middle East seem so alien to us. But the piece I want to talk about today, or actually the piece Joan asked me to talk about today, is terror. And terror is one of the points, I think, where the fear of Islam, or 
um, anti-Muslim anti-Semitism shows its resemblance to Jewish anti-Semitism. And here I am telling you nothing you do not already know. But the old figure, the 19th, early 20th century figure of the Jewish anarchist, the Jewish communist, who was sort of a bomb-throwing, rootless cosmopolite, joined in a loose network whose, to borrow Paul Berman's term, whose tentacles spread over the globe. That, it seems to me, is essentially the portrait of the modern jihadi. And in each case, there's also a certain um, construction of this, you know, the anarchist or the jihadi, the terrorist, as being against the state, as being before the state in the sense of being tribal and not yet having achieved the state, but also being opposed to the state, being against not only states but the state system. One of the things I obviously want to target, and this is both a, a, fair, a popular, at least in the French sense, I hope, a popular book and a polemical one, um, is, that, is that anti-Semitism. Um, the other, however, is something else. I'm interested in the way that the question of terror and the way we talk about the Muslim terrorists reveals a set of anxieties that I think are quite important to democracy or a set of anxieties that are allied to a deep and profound anxiety about democracy itself. Fear of the many and fear of the one. Now, and I should say also, temporal fears. Fear of what we have been and fear of what we might become. The fear of what we have been, I think, is, is visible in the sense that Muslim terrorists are the enemies of Western modernity. That they, um, they are, and that is to say, they are the enemies of the West and of modernity. And here I've been very influenced by Faisal Debji's work in Landscapes of Jihad. And the question he raises, what if Muslim terrorists bear a family resemblance to, what should we call them, founding figures of Western modernity? What if they're the Protestant ethic in the spirit of Islam? And um, the, when I first read uh, Faisal Debji's book, I kept thinking of that, um, the assassination of Sadat. And there's Sadat on his re reviewing platform being filmed, not for you two, but and then well, um, but sort of actually. And he's shot, and the assassin then turns to the camera and says, "My name is Khalid is Islambuli, and I have just killed Pharaoh, and I am not afraid to die." And what fascinated me about this, and I this is a sort of scholarly and geekish fascination, maybe is how much that echoed the English regicide. You know, when Cromwell says, it was not a thing done in a corner. Or when they ask Thomas Harrison when he's going to his death, where is your good old cause now? And he says, here in my bosom, and I will seal it in, with my blood. That that willingness to um, own the act, I think, is really quite, very much a part of that modernizing moment of the English Civil Wars. Um, but it, we don't, we like to forget, I think, that that is our past. And we mute some of the other acts of terrorism in which we might legitimately take pride. For example, the terrorism of the suffragettes. You know, we tend to think of the suffragettes as being like the mom in Mary Poppins. You know, kind of silly and pretty and, not, and a little feckless. But the suffragettes were bomb throwers. They were, in many cases, extremely violent. And I was, I have to admit, it took me a long time to find this out, and I was so happy when I found it out. It's not that I'm particularly bloodthirsty, but the erasure of that kind of, of passion and also the willingness to own the act, the willingness, the willingness to die on behalf of it, was, I think, not something we should be so ready to forget. So I think that part of this arises from a certain unwillingness in, in the West to remember what we have been, um, to our eagerness to forget that the origins of modernity are, in Nietzsche's terms, soaked in blood thoroughly and for a long time. But there's also a fear of the, of the present and a fear of what we might become. And some of this is, of course, associated with the familiar fears about the many, with floods of immigrants, um, with boatloads of economic and political refugees, a fear of being overwhelmed by the alien, that, you know, that your kids are going to grow up to eat couscous instead of coco vin. Um, doesn't really seem that bad, but it <laughs> seems to really distress the French sometimes. And I think this is the same 
fear that animated white flight. You know, just, they're coming, they're coming, whoever, whoever they may happen to be. And it's not only a fear, I think, that we will find ourselves surrounded by Muslims, but that we will somehow be at home with them. And of course, we already are. For many of us. I mean, the book, the book has a happy ending. And that is the happy ending. That most of us live in the territory that Paul Gilroy calls conviviality. We get along just fine in the hospital, at work, and in many respects in our neighborhoods. So, but this is not. That's, so that fear of the many, I think, <clears throat> reflects that, an anxiety about the alien and about becoming other to ourselves. But there's also the fear of the one. And I think this is the fear that comes out most in fear of the terrorist, that the terrorist is generally figured as a sort of solitary individual, well-educated, acting you know, in a small group or alone. Um, and that fear of the one, I think, is a fear, the old Hobbesian fear that anyone could kill anyone else, the fear that for Hobbes grounds our common equality but it's also a fear of the assimilated immigrant, you know, of um, the fear that you never really know what someone else is thinking. You know, is that other person, does that other person mean, mean, mean you well? Does that other person mean you harm? And what is going on in their heads? And of course, we never know that, as, as Wittgenstein and many other people pointed out, and indeed, your common sense would tell you. And so you never know who that terrorist might be. It might be, you know, it might be the person sitting next to you. You know, it might be the bomb might be in, in the bag or the backpack. And it might be in a bag or a backpack that look really ordinary. And this produces an intense anxiety. Um, you know, like all those, all those signs of see something, say something. <coughs> but it's kind of silly because you couldn't possibly say something all the time. Because I don't know what's in your bag. You don't know what's in my bag. And that, that pervasive anxiety about one, about one another, it's the human condition. It's the condition in which we live, in which we are fundamentally alien and impenetrable to one another. But it's also, in this immediate sense, a fear of an assimilated immigrant. The fear that even if they become like us, even if they seem to fit in the neighborhood, they might not really fit in the neighborhood. And um, that something alien remains in them, that there's something still a little foreign about them, that they have other memories, that they have other ideas, and that these other ideas may prove explosive. And I think that is a rational fear. I, not only I do, do I think it's a rational fear, I think it's right. I think it's true that immigrants have other ideas and that those ideas may prove explosive in very much the kind of sense that Nietzsche used when he said, I'm not a man, I'm dynamite. That these ideas really can blow worlds apart. And when something blows up, what happens? You know, all the fragments are scattered. And you can't sort out anymore what was Muslim, what was Christian, what was a believer, what was an atheist, what was yours and what was not. And that very corporeal metaphor, I think, captures an anxiety about thought. That, um, that after the bombs go off, we won't know whose things were whose. We won't know what was alien and what was our own. We will have been mixed in a way which is irrevocable, and inextricable. And for some people, I think that, is a, that it produces great horror. And for some people, I think it produces a certain sense of wonder, that things might indeed be different than they are. That, um, that opening, and whether it opens on to fear or wonder, is, I think, that the, op the opening that all people, but Democrats in particular, confront in relation to each other. And it requires something of us. It's not just fear of the Muslim, it's fear of any other, fear of all others, because we are all somewhat alien to each other. And it connects to um, 
or this that project has brought me to a new one um, about democracy and particularly to the recognition that democracy requires it doesn't I think we are taught I think we're taught primarily by liberals and liberalism to think that what democracy requires of us is that we be tolerant and civil and I think that's not adequate. I think democracy requires something else of us. I think democracy requires us to be brave. That in a, in a democracy, you live every day with your enemies. You live with people who wish you were not there. Because you're gay, because you've had an abortion, um, for any number of reasons because you don't want people to be gay or have an abortion, for a whole variety of reasons. They don't want you there. And you know they don't want you there. And if they could be rid of you, they would. And we all know this. And we walk every day on the street with people that we know wish us great harm. But we do it with an unthinking and casual courage. And I think that's what democracy depends upon. It depends upon the willingness to walk among your enemies. And not just because you trust them. It requires you to, t to hold on to that sense of fearlessness. <coughs> and I was reminded of that, I must say, when I was watching people in Tahrir Square, for whom that, that capacity to walk among their enemies was momentarily surprising and deeply pleasurable. Because it is, it does breed in us, I think, a sense of great delight, not only in, in one another and in, the, and in that possibility that things might be different, but in our own courage. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, and actually, this was, um, we, it was very nice. We're having Joan for, to present her own work in February, and it was, I believe, Joan's idea to kind of have this nice little flip where Anne's going to be the primary person, and then uh, she will present later. Um, but let me give you a long introduction, because Joan Scott has been very influential to me personally, and her work is groundbreaking, really theoretically, in terms of a lot of what this um, this year we're going to try to be try to do. And that is um, really Joan's work has to do with the question of difference in history. And she uses um, many different enunciations, implementations, juxtapositions, justifications, and transformations. And she has, and she looks at really the construction of social life and political life. And she really was um, pivotal for me in understanding gender in a totally different construct, the construct of difference as opposed to the construct, I guess you might say, of gender. So she has a, a, an ability to understand the universalizing, universalizing force of democratic politics. Going forward, though, her books have been many and very influential, but I would like to take a moment just to list them, going, um, starting from the beginning, going backwards. The first was Gender and the Politics of History, Only Paradoxes to Offer, French Feminists and the Rights of Man, Parité, Sexual Equality, and the Crisis of French Universalism, The Fantasy of Feminist History, the Politics of Veil, that was um, what was also inspirational for this grant because that was published in the public square as well, and so I read it very closely. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, she, and she was, I think I met her back in 2005 or so um, when I was just embarking on the public square, and I was out there to get some book on the issues of the day, and um, I called her up, and she was just so generous with her time, and she happened to have something that almost seemed as if it was in her drawer. <laughs> so she's just been... Um, tremendous in getting me to explore really Europe and um, looking at different aspects, again, in comparative perspective to the United States. And so it was her work that gave me the, one of the initial ideas, really, for taking a look at European and United States juxtapositions, but how we all regard um, the Muslim question. And then it was so happened that Anne was working on something similar. So in any case, um, she has also worked at many venerable institutions and been a very big force in them. Uh, and most lastly, she, or lastly, she's been at the Institute of Advanced Study, which is a very stimulating uh, institution. So without further ado, let me present Joan. She'll just speak for 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I have to say, just listening to Anne now, um, I want to give a little blurb for her book. <laughs> in, in, a, in a way, my whole 
comments are, are going to be like that. But what you didn't hear in her presentation was her outrage at what can only be called the Islamophobia of um, people who pretend to be democratic theorists. Uh, there are just incredible um, outbursts of impatience and, and um, even anger. Rage. 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 <laughs> Out, outrage. <laughs> Um, that make the book really exciting and um, engaging and interesting to read. So when it does come out, which is what, February or March, um, I urge you to, to uh, get your hands on it and, and to read it. What I want to do is, to, in some ways, is go over, is, is give you a reading of my reading of um, not so much the whole manuscript as this particular, well, both the whole manuscript and the particular chapter on terrorism that um, she asked us to read. The title of Anne's book, as, as Ruth mentioned, is a deliberate gesture to Marx on the Jewish question, which was written, as many of you know, in response to Bruno Bauer's essay of the same title. Bauer wrote in 1843, as debate raged in Prussia about rescinding Jewish citizenship, a citizenship that had been granted in 1812 under the influence of Napoleonic constitutions, which accepted the French Revolution's decision to emancipate the Jews as individuals, but not in the terms of one of the French revolutionaries, not as a nation. As Norton puts it, the Jewish question raised the issue of political theology more generally. And her book is an attempt to look at the, a latter day set of issues around the question of political theology. Bauer argued that the primary religious identification of the Jews was incompatible with their political emancipation. His is a Hegelian argument about the need to subsume particularities, in this case religious particularities, to the universal mission of the necessarily secular state. Marx's reply, written in 1844, takes up Bauer's argument as a way of critiquing the liberal state, insisting that emancipation is not possible when individuals are treated abstractly, shorn of the social context in which their lives are lived. It is by no means sufficient to ask, Marx writes, who should emancipate it, who should be emancipated. The critic should ask a third question, what kind of emancipation is involved? He continues, and this is a longer quote, the question of the relations between political emancipation and religion becomes for us a question of the relations between political emancipation and human emancipation, end of quote. In the course of his essay, Marx turns the question on its head. The Jewish question becomes a critique, not of Jewish religious practices, but of liberal political theory, the notion of formal rights versus social rights and of capitalism. And in fact, it's his critique of capitalism that often leads to the charges that that particular essay is anti-Semitic because he associates the Jews with uh, capitalist um, um, barons, capitalist uh, activity. Anne's book follows a similar course on the Muslim question makes the case that today's Muslim question is yesterday's Jewish question. The debate raises similar points. Are Muslims, given their commitment to public forms of religious observance, capable of becoming citizens of democratic nation states? That's the question certainly raised in many of the European countries. Does their particularity contradict the idea of a universal secular political state? Do Muslims represent an alien culture or alien culture or civilization, the 18th century would have said nation, whose values are so antithetical to those of the democratic West that assimilation is ultimately impossible. Norton examines these questions and the answers offered to them by a wide variety of spokesmen and women. She exposes their contradictions, their smug racism, the illogic of the claims they make. And like Marx, she formulates a critique of Western liberal individualism and of the way its defenders displace anxiety about its contradictions onto Muslim others. And here's a quote from the book. The figure of the Muslim stands like a sentinel marking the limits of the West. The state system, human rights, civil freedom, democracy, sovereignty, even the simple requirements of bare life. End of quote. The chapter she asked us to read, Terror and the Muslim Question, is a good, concise example of her method. She focuses it on the affect of fear, as she's just told us. There is fear of the many, Muslims will outbreed us, and fear of the one, the lone suicide bomber. But there's also the fear of the loss of integrity of our civilizational boundaries, 
the long-standing assumption of the superiority of modern Western ways of life. Part of that superiority, Norton argues, rests on the convenient forgetting of the role of violence in the construction of democracy. Quote, the language of martyrdom and tyrannicide is central to Protestant reform and central, too, to the liberal revolutions in the West, end of quote. In the light of this history that includes, as she's told us, Cromwell's army, 19th century anarchists, British suffragists, the African National Congress, and more, the anxiety about Muslim violence is, in a sense, the return of the repressed, and in more than one way. It's not only about the legacy of violence that established our democratic nation states, but the violence that continues to be exercised by those states. From this perspective, terrorism is not the antithesis of liberalism, but its product. Here, Norton's book complements what anthropologist Talal Assad has written about suicide bombing. It's a 2007 um, collection of, of his essays, which were the Wellick Lectures um, in 2006. Both located not in some historically backward civilization, but as an aspect of modernity. Mortal violence, writes Assad, is integral to liberalism as a political formation. Insisting, as Norton does, that there are not two antithetical formations, the West versus Islam, but interconnections everywhere, transport, treaties, trade, oil, Assad refuses the secular narrative of the superiority of Western civilization. That narrative, he says, serves to justify exceptions to the rules of warfare that serve to make state violence legitimate and terrorism its illegitimate external enemy. Quote, the absolute right to defend oneself by force becomes, in the context of industrial capitalism, the freedom to use violence globally. When social difference is seen as backwardness and backwardness as a source of danger to civilized society, self-defense calls for a project of reordering the world in which the rules of civilized warfare cannot be allowed to stand in the way. How is this different, Assad asks, from the terrorism that seeks to found or to defend a free political community with its own law, end of quote. Norton takes the argument in a somewhat different direction with her dissection of the emotion of fear. Instead of accepting the claim that this fear is new, produced by an enemy hitherto unknown to us, or at least one kept outside the walls of civilized life, Norton suggests we return to Hobbes, good political theorist that she is, who thought that our, natural uh, quote, that our natural condition is one in which every man fears every other. From this perspective, the suicide bomber is the latest avatar of this fear that cannot be eliminated, a fear attached to the fact that no individual is ever wholly, unknown, uh, is ever wholly known. We are uh, all others to each other, and so, quote, the terrorist is the dark side of individualism, the reminder that those terrible powers of destruction lie within our reach. By taking her argument to this level of generality, Norton succeeds in bringing terrorism into our context, not as a foreign element corrupting our otherwise peaceful existence, but as a familiar aspect of our political and psychic life. In this way, she effectively tames its otherness. Terrorism becomes not our other, but a projection of ourselves. Norton's book is a short, brilliant critique in the formal meaning of that term, an attempt to undermine our settled, taken-for-granted assumptions to reveal the blind spots of our common sense. And I have to say it's not easy to have your blind spots um, uncovered or, or unmasked. I, I felt that when I was reading it. Um, I think others will find it disturbing at the same time that it's engaging and fascinating. It raises a whole bunch of questions, and, and our talks do that as well, that we might want to discuss today. What is the modern status of Islamic movements? Um, is the familiarity of, of the terrorist, uh, the, especially the suicide bomber, is that about fear of assimilated immigrants or a legitimate fear of some kind of um, unknown, unexpected, unforeseen violence? Is it about a fear of boundary transgression, they becoming too much like us, or is something else um, going on? It seems to me that that um, when the blind spots of your common sense are called into question, it's profoundly disturbing as well as engaging to try to think with um, somebody who's doing that to you. Like Marx's essay, hers too is informed by an alternative vision of how things might be. As she said, there's a happy ending to the book. She points out at the end of the book that there are communities all over the world in which people already live together 
without drawing invidious lines of difference among themselves. The epigraph at the beginning of the book from Al-Farabi on the democratic city offers the vision of what might be. And here's the quote. On the surface, it looks like an embroidered garment full of colored figures and dyes. Everybody loves it and loves to reside in it because there's no human wish or desire that this city does not satisfy. The, na the nations emigrate to it and reside there, and it grows beyond measure. People of every race multiply in it, and this by all kinds of copulation and marriages. Strangers cannot be distinguished from the residents. All kinds of wishes and ways of life are to be found in it. The bigger, the more civilized, the more populated, the more productive, and the more perfect it is, the more prevalent, and the greater are the good and the evil it possesses. End of quote. In this image, we have Norton the critic, joined by Norton the political theorist, offering us an answer to the Muslim question that in her writing becomes more plausible than any we have had so far. <laughs> 